the technology is successful. And thank you very much for Fran Francis coming up with this idea at such short notice. So today we're going to discuss principles for best spatial and behavioural practice in the context of unexpected home-based work. My name's Jane Klossick and I'm the convener of the research seminar. And our guest today is Dr. Frances Hollis, and she's an international expert in design for home-based work. And she's emeritus reader in architecture at the CAS, an expert on the architecture of home-based work. And she's got a wonderful website which contains her research called theworkhome.com. And she's also published on the topic in her book, Beyond Live Work, The Architecture of Home-Based Work, and in dash number 15, Homework City. So we're going to start the seminar with Frances giving us her top tips for sane homework, something that we've all been trying to tackle. And of course, our sanity is being impacted by more than just the, the difficulties of having to work from home. And we've got a period after that, she'll hopefully speak for about 30, 40 minutes, something like that, Francis. And then we'll have time for questions. And we're going to finish at 10 to 8 tonight, rather than 8 o'clock. And the reason for that is that we have this evening the 8 p.m. cheering on our NHS session. Can everybody hear me all right? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good, sorry. Um, I've lost the, the technology is letting me down. I've lost the screen. I can't see any of you at the moment. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Francis and Francis, if you can make an attempt to share your screen if you haven't already done so. Well, I can't see it. Can you? I can see that I can see a little section of your screen and I can see a message. Oh, no, that's our messages. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Good. No, your yeah. Screen. yeah. And yeah. if during Francis's presentation questions occur to you, please do type them in the chat for everyone to see and then other people can add to them. Might be quite a, a nice way to organise questions for the seminar, actually. Um, and indeed, I suspect we might have some interesting conversations about our own experiences that we've had over the last week or so. So, Francis. Good. OK, thank you very much for that introduction, Jane. And um, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. And for me, this is, an, well, as for all of us, this is an extraordinary time. It's unprecedented. Um, it's a real change of our world order and all our lives have changed unrecognizably. But my life has changed in a very strange way because I've been researching the architecture of home-based work for more than 15 years. And uh, from the CAS, starting it when I was jointly running the first year and set a project to combine dwelling and workplace and found that there was nothing written on it. And it's been a massive journey, but um, it's been very difficult to get people to take any notice of it because architects really are interested in monofunctional buildings. And this is a dual function building, this building I call the work home that combines dwelling and workplace. And so I have been beavering away, researching and writing and writing and researching and then sudden, and, and always with the idea that this was a very sustainable uh, working practice that potentially, um, it had enormous potential in terms of um, the, the sustainability in, the, in terms of the environment, in terms of the economy, social sustainability. Um, but it never crossed my mind that, that one day I would wake up and find that uh, home-based work was government policy across the world and suddenly a quarter of the global population were locked in their homes and people were having to work from home. 
Um, it's always been a principle of mine that I think home-based work is a really, really interesting thing, but it has to be voluntary. And, uh, and how successful it is um, depends very much on four factors. It depends on the nature of the work, the space available, the, the, the nature of the household, and the personality of the individual who's doing it. But of course, what we've got at the moment is no choice. Everyone's having to work from home. So, so my research up until this point has been about designing for home-based work. It's been about, uh, it's been a, in a way, a long campaign to try to change the way we design houses or housing. Um, in the UK and in the Western world, we, we, we think of housing as somewhere where we, we, we cook, we eat, we bathe, we sleep. We look after our children and we watch television and nothing else. But of course, um, for the last 15 years, um, a great many people have worked from home across the social spectrum and in a very wide range of different occupations. And um, many of them inhabit extraordinarily interesting buildings. And so that has been my focus, has been to look at the buildings of the people who are working from home, to analyze them, to think about what works and what doesn't work and to come up with a whole set of principles. And Jane has outlined my um, uh, website and a lot of the principles are there and, and there are more in the first book I wrote. Um, but of course, what we're dealing with now is something completely different. So while I have expertise in the architecture of home-based work, in many ways, I think this is an entirely new situation. And so in some ways, we are all experts and we are all exploring this together. And that's how I'd like to approach this tonight, because everyone who's, who's attending this is working from home and is facing their own challenges and is already refining their practice and working out what works and what doesn't work and what and what's a disaster and what's wonderful etc etc so um what i've done is i've jettisoned all my old images and about three days ago i put out a call for um on facebook and twitter for people to share images and stories of their home-based work post-COVID. And so this talk is made up of those images. And um, what I'm, so what I'm trying to do in this talk is not come up with what I normally do, which is principles for designing good work homes, but thinking through ways of people coping in housing that is built today. Now, most of the housing that's built today um, is built to a model that was, um, that was initiated at the beginning of the, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, that was specifically designed to prevent home-based work. And very often uh, managed through tenancy agreements that prohibited it. And so the model that we have of the, ooh, my internet connection's unstable. I hope this is gonna be all right. So the model of housing that we have is, is the sort of standard uh, one, two, three bedroom flats works very badly for home-based work in general. Um, but that is what a lot of people are having to inhabit today um, and this week and all over the world. And so we're, squeezing home-based work into spaces that have been specifically designed to try to stop us from doing that. So what I've tried to do is to come up with, in a way to come up with some ideas to support people who are working from home. Um, things that we can do to, that can help us because obviously this is an extremely difficult moment. Okay. Francis, can I just interrupt you for a second? Can you put your slides on full screen? Aren't they? They're not on full screen for me. 
How's that? Better. Ah, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the way it's worked up until this crisis is that the more privileged members of our society have had purpose-built work homes designed to meet their needs perfectly. And these can be extremely different in all sorts of different ways. The, the, the lucky ones, not quite so privileged, but still lucky, inhabit spaces that are big enough for them to be able to under inhabit their spaces. And so they have extra space that they can convert into workspace. And then the least privileged are the people who inhabit, uh, who generally renters are, are in flats that are, that are very densely populated and don't have any extra space. So that's the way it's worked up until now. And in a way, I suppose I am, I am pitching this at this last group because I think that uh, people, who, people who have got purpose-built work homes are like pigs in clover at the moment. I'm speaking to people like that and they say, I've never been happier. And people who have got space, who've got underused spaces, um, are obviously putting them into use, but it's what you do if you haven't got the space that I think is extremely interesting. So that's where I'm going to, to go now. Okay, so um, a whole load of, of tips. One of the people who replied to me on uh, Facebook sent me this, which is a piece of art by Lucy Gunning, hmm. climbing around my bedroom. And she said that when she was trying to work out how to fit her work into this very small two bedroom flat that she inhabited with a flatmate, this is what she felt like. And I really like these images because I think what it does is it makes you, it, it encourages us to scrutinize the space we've got with completely fresh eyes. So the first top tip, I can't actually see my own, oh, well, that's all right, I know them. Top tip one, one size does not fit all. And I think in a way, this is the beauty of working from home. Most of the people, I've interviewed dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of home-based workers, and uh, the very, very vast majority say they love home-based work after they've moaned at me for an hour or two about all the problems that they face as home-based workers. But the reason they love it is that it gives them more control of their lives. Now, this is a sort of conundrum at the moment because we have had control of our lives reduced very substantially, but there are still extraordinary positives to working from home. So this, um, this person who sent me those first two images, this was, this was the home-based workspace that she sent me. And you can see that she just sits on this little cushion with her laptop on her lap and looks out of the window. And obviously, there's this sort of massive range. And I think there's a temptation for people to try to, to replicate what they have in the office. But that absolutely doesn't necessarily have to be the case. This is an IT worker for Volkswagen. And it's in his bedroom. And um, when he's in bed, he looks at his work. And so in some ways, I think this is interesting. This is somebody who's emptied their clothes out of their wardrobe and has put their desk into their wardrobe so that when they go to bed, they can close the wardrobe and shut the bedroom off. And so this is to do with creating some degree of separation and also to do with, with people developing their, their, their ingenuity. I think it's making this work is a, is a lot to do with creativity. Lots of people work from bed. I know two um, renowned authors who work in bed all the time, and it's not a ridiculous thing to do. But for some people, the separation between uh, dwelling and workplace, or if you've got two people working in a very small space is really important. So here we've got uh, someone who um, 
is in a studio apartment and is is there with their partner and they're both working from home and so she set up her workspace in the hall i really like these examples because i think it shows you know it's it's uh, they illustrate some of the principles that i i work with um when I'm thinking about designing, but these are people actually carving out space in their homes that they haven't necessarily thought of as workspace. One of the things about working from home is you really can work how you want to. And I think that, um, I think that that's a really important thing to, to take hold of and to, to realize that you have that, that we have that potential. It's a matter of actually working out how we work best, how we like to work, and then fitting our work into our spaces in that way. This is a meditator, um, serious Buddhist who's just set up his computer in front of his meditation cushion. And this one obviously has a child. So that's the first tip, is that one size doesn't fit all. And that was one of the really big problems with the, the live work movement of the 1980s and 90s, was that the buildings were designed as if all home-based workers were the same and needed the same spaces. Okay, top tip two is, Design your journey to work. One of the really big issues for home-based workers is how you make the transition between work and home. Um, and there are, when you're working from home, there are many ways to do that. And probably the least successful is just to turn your computer on. Um, and much more successful are, uh, this is, this is a, uh, someone who works in one of the governmental departments at quite a senior level. And what she's doing is that every morning, very early, she goes for a long walk. And when she goes out the door, she's leaving home. And when she comes back in again, she's going to work. And I think this is an extremely successful way because the research shows people hate commuting, but actually they also find the commute useful because it helps them to make this transition between their home life and their work life. Other people I've interviewed who have, um, have found different ways of making this transition, um, a pair of artists who were in a, a Welsh um, cottage who had the studio next door and they would pack up their lunch every day, go out the back door, up the mountain for an hour, back down again, into the studio, eat their lunch in the studio and at the end of the day, back up the mountain again. Um, not many of us are lucky enough to have a mountain outside our back door. but. Um, other people I've interviewed have changed their clothes. So an architect um, would come down to breakfast in his sort of uh, pajamas or his leisure gear, and then he'd go upstairs and he'd put his suit on. And when he came downstairs in his suit, he knew he was working. And when he finished his working day, he went upstairs, took his suit off, and when he came down, he knew he'd, knew he'd finished his work. Other people transform their spaces. So a music teacher, I interviewed um, had her piano and her, her music stand where she taught her flute um, students in her living room and what she did when the, the working day was over was she rolled a, a, a rug out of fluffy a, a sort of sheepskin rug she she draped something over her chair she changed the lighting so she was signaling to herself that the work day was over an architect I interviewed who um, lived at his office. He had a tiny little um, hidden single bedroom behind his technical library. He um, did exactly the same thing. At the end of the working day, he changed the lighting and he put the music on and he moved certain pieces of furniture around just to create his idea of what the domestic environment was. So the next top tip, work is an activity and not a place. And I think it's a, a, one of the issues that people speak about is the loss of 
a sense of occupational identity when you're working from home. When we go to work, we, we are, our occupational identity um, is reinforced by going into this building and being given respect by uh, the people in the building or on the way to the building or whatever. And you don't get that at home, but I think if we, f if we try to remember that it's the activity that matters and not the place, and then we can work wherever is necessary. And if it happens to be in the, the laundry room, then so be it. Um, uh, we'll come to acoustics later, but sound separation is one of the really, really important factors between people who are, who are sharing uh, a work together. So the space may be chaotic, but it doesn't mean that the mind is chaotic and it doesn't mean that the work is poor. The work coming out of this workspace may be of a very high, I happen to know it is, of a very high quality. And so it's terribly important we don't trip ourselves up with those notions of our occupational identity. Okay, next top tip. Top tip number four, design your time. One of the things that people really, really enjoy about home-based work, and I think this can function for people who have it imposed on them, as well as people who've chosen to do it, is the possibility of organizing the day really to suit themselves. If you work best at five o'clock in the morning in your pajamas, then there's absolutely no reason why you can't, because you are only being judged on your work. There is no sense of having to be there. And obviously in the UK, since the, since the Industrial Revolution, we have this idea that um, our presence is needed at work. You know, the, the factory clocking on and clocking off, that actually it's the hours that we spend in work that are the important ones. But um, I think what people find is that they, they work out new ways of working ways of actually helping them to really enjoy their life rather than just going to work and then coming home at the end of the day so this is someone who um obviously has has changed the ways that she's working as, as a result of being in full home another really really useful thing is oh i think really the important thing is that there is this concept of work hygiene that actually we have to learn how to how to organize how to contain our work how to organize our work how to contain our homes how to contain ourselves how to contain our partners our bosses our colleagues and this is a skill this is a new skill that everyone that we're all learning and I think that um, Again, it's something that I remember interviewing an architect who was working from home um, uh, and from Brisley, actually. And he said he said his first year was a complete washout because his friends and family would ring him in the mornings. He would wander about. He he couldn't really focus. But once he really once he once he practiced enough and once he'd really taught his friends and his families and his clients when he was working and when he wasn't and got them to respect that then he found it was absolutely fine um, so we do have more control when we work from home so when do we work best this is a crucial thing um, one person I interviewed who was a, a social policy researcher said that she never worked for more than an hour at a time and then she interleaved the domestic, uh, the domestic work. And she said, she said, a quote was, I'm often think, oh, I think I might have got it next, uh, come back to that. So another really useful thing to do is to um, set a schedule and to negotiate that with other members of your household. Um, uh, this is a schedule by someone who works in a think tank and, um, and she and her partner have three-year-old twins. And uh, I've always used her as a litmus test for whether home-based work setup works. Because I always say, well, throw in a pair of six-month-old twins and what happens? And so when this happened, 
I rang her up and I said, Katie, how's it going? <laughs> I said, what is happening in your household? The twins are now three. And what she said was that they have this, um, she and her partner, Eleanor, have this, um, this schedule that they have set. And they're lucky enough to have two rooms where they can, a room each to work in, and they have a garden where they can play with the, with the girls. But so far, it's working perfectly well, which I was really, really interested and surprised about. And I think, I mean, she says that the, the, the schedule is already um, breaking down because uh, work calls come, her partner works in one of the government departments. Um, but I think that in principle, the system is working. And in fact, they're really enjoying it because they're spending so much more time with their children. Here we are, this is the quote from the social policy researcher. And I think that's also a really interesting one because we imagine that when we go to work, we do work. And when we're at home, we do home, but actually, we're always thinking about both things at once or nearly always. And so it's the way that we can move between them. And I think that uh, this is very helpful to, to, to bear in mind. I think the other thing to think about is uh, to try to be really efficient um, because there's the, the whole idea at the moment of the four day week is being played with, being, being um, experimented with. And the idea is that you get paid for five days on a four day week um, if, you, if you meet your outputs for the five day week in four days. And what they're finding, what the research is finding is that um, people can do it. They just cut out checking their Facebook. They cut out the domestic phone calls. They cut out all those things during the working day because the temptation to have the lure of the third uh, home day, the third, the long weekend is sufficient to encourage them to do that. And I think that's something we can do in terms of home-based work. If we become super efficient when we're working, then we can, uh, we can, we can have that extra day off, which actually um, in the late 19th century, they called St. Monday. And the workers would, um, if they earned enough during the week, they would have the weekend off and then they would have Monday off as well. And if they could afford it, they'd have a St. Tuesday as well which drove their employers mad, but it meant that basically they worked as much as they needed to and they maximized the amount of fun time that they had. Okay, top tip number five, uh -huh. distraction. Locate your workspace as far from likely distractions as possible. Um, distractions are a really interesting issue and I think that it's something in the home that everyone 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 has their own demons and um i i interviewed one person who was distracted by the fridge constantly and put on uh, a couple of stone when she started to work from home i interviewed a, a baptist minister who was distracted by computer games and she if she had a binge would would sit for two hours doing one of these sort of bang 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 killing computer games uh, guiltily in her in her workspace um, other other people i've spoken to um, get caught up with sport and i think that um, these are all things just to be completely aware of and to try to and to try to 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 keep yourself away from i mean in 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 any 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 building that has stairs in it I've always suggested that people have their workspace as far away from the kitchen as they can do. That working in the kitchen is particularly difficult for people who are tempted by the fridge because every time you get stuck or you get bored, there's a temptation to eat something. Top tip number six, sound matters. Um, acoustics was one of the, acoustic separation was one of the, when I, I, I did my doctoral research, I interviewed 76 home-based workers 
in urban, suburban and rural contexts across the social spectrum in as wide a range of different occupations and buildings as I could find. And I was really surprised to find that sound was one of the things that was mentioned most frequently because um, we home-based workers are disturbed by their household members. They're disturbed by their own domestic appliances. They're disturbed by noises from the street and they're disturbed by their neighbors. The worst I heard was somebody who couldn't work because his neighbor was uh, abusing, was beating and shouting at their child. It was a very, very difficult situation. So I think this is something that we have to be really, um, really mindful of. And I suppose the completely obvious ones are, I spoke to, to a counselor and a barrister earlier and they decided they're in a house, they had to work on different floors because um, when they were both on the, on the phone, um, they disturbed each other. The person who had the little perch on her, on her windowsill, she said that in their flat, when they were both on the phone, it was like a call center. So I love this image, uh, which is someone who has put a tent up in the garden to put the children in. Uh, so it's somewhere where the children can go when they need quiet in the house, or alternatively, it's somewhere where an adult can go to have uh, a, a quiet conversation when they need it. I think one of the, one of the things is um, obviously earphones, earplugs, but also we have a tendency, and I don't know if I'm doing it now, we have a tendency to raise our voices when we're on the phone. And so it's just that mindfulness, but it, it is extremely difficult. I had, to, uh, I had to instruct my partner because we're doing this tonight. It's like, okay, I need you to be quiet tonight. Okay, take steps to avoid social isolation. Social isolation is well known to be uh, probably the biggest uh, disadvantage of home-based work. And uh, for, for people who, who, who live in big households of one sort or another, this isn't a problem. But for people who, who live alone or who um, live with uh, someone who they don't have much connection with, if you're flatmates and you don't see each other or know each other very well, this is a really major issue. And I think it's, it's, it's difficult to, um, it's difficult, it's really difficult in the current circumstances to work out how to deal with this. I mean, in my street, we, have, we are having um, shout outs across, the, across from street to street. I've been in social isolation for, social isolation, self isolation for um, 15 days now. You know, and it, it is interesting. It's a real challenge, even though I'm not alone in the house. Um, but we're opening our upstairs windows and we are able to communicate across the street absolutely fine. And obviously, there are many ways of communicating online, Zoom calls with friends and families. But I think it's particularly important to, um, to take great care of this because otherwise, particularly at the moment, with so much anxiety just about what's happening in the world and about um, the safety of people we care about or financial insecurities or whatever it is. Um, uh, social isolation needs to be avoided wherever it can be. Take care of your body. Okay, this um, is uh, another person who was setting their, their workspace up like this and uh, wrote to tell me that after a little while, their body really hurt. And I wrote and said, is it bad achy, i.e. you need to not do this anymore, or good achy, as in you're using uh, muscles you haven't used before? And she said, bad achy, definitely. So um, another person, um, a, a different person from a, a think tank, was working on her sofa because she'd got a study, but the internet didn't work. So it's terribly important to take care of these sorts of technical things and get the booster or whatever it is to get the internet working so that you can work 
in a situation. She was getting terrible backache on the sofa. Uh, simple, uh, a number of people have sent these. Uh, uh, ironing board as, a, as an adjustable height standing, standing desk. So ingenuity. It's like I, I've been sent loads of uh, people with computers on upturned laundry baskets or jigsaw puzzles or whatever. You know, get your workspace into a situation where actually it feels good for your body. This is someone with a, a who's turned a, 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 a what do you call those running machines, a, a treadmill, and they've just put a plank across, and they said that they had used they had run two and a half miles during meetings that day. So be outside where you can. This is, this is really obvious. Um, it lifts the spirits. It means you're using any outside space that you've got as a, um, as a resource, as a working space. Um, but obviously not, meant, not everybody has outside space, but um, lots of people have balconies and sitting on the balcony and working outside can be absolutely delightful. Oh, in terms of the looking after your body, obviously the exercising every day is terribly important. So the person from the government department at the beginning who was going for a long walk on the way to work, she, she um, covers both those bases at once. And I think there's a, there can be a tendency to really sludge um, in the home if you're both living and working there, uh, particularly if you're working in bed or on the sofa. And so it's a sort of terribly important thing to take, take care of. <coughs> All situations are workable, one of, my, um, one of my fundamental mottos. And so I think that creativity is, is crucial in, um, in all approaches to this, this business of working from home in spaces that have been spe really specifically designed not to work for home-based work. So um, I like this one, just somebody who was working out how to, how to set up their screen when it wouldn't clamp to the table. Small piece of kit can make a big difference. This is a, a, a university administrator and they just found they needed this little tripod to hold the phone for their, um, for their phone Zoom meetings. Remember this could save you a lot of money. This is a singer who just before the lockdown, she lives in and works in Barcelona and she sent off for a uh, uh, flashy, the thing standing up in the middle is, a, is a, a very neat piece of kit, it's a microphone, and she set up a home studio, and what she said was that in the first week of using her, as you can see, her, her, her workspace as a, a studio, she saved the money that she would have uh, spent on hiring a studio. And don't forget to have fun. This one was sent by uh, an academic at the Royal College of Art and uh, she's working in a tiny flat with her partner um, on the kitchen table seven days a week but on Saturday morning she um, converts it to a train set and uh, and I think this this lightens her week and so um, I think it's having fun realizing that yes in the middle of disaster there is plenty of space and that actually we have a lot of freedom to do what we feel like um and then, so there we are i think that's it i think that's my last top tip so this is the this is my book um that's the website um this is the second book that i've collaborated with um uh, a housing research unit in Delft on, which is basically looking at um, home-based work at the, at the scale of the urban block. Good, okay, that's it.
Thank you very much, Francis. That was really, really interesting. I've, I, I'm already thinking we should turn this into a maybe a shorter YouTube video and start getting it out to people. Um, I wonder if people have questions for Francis. If you do, Robin, you said there's a way of raising your hand. Can you just explain how to do that? Um, yeah, um, it's if you go into um, hover over the bottom of the screen, um, there's share screen and next to that is participants. If you mm. click on that, then you get a list of all of the participants, um, including yourself. Um, uh, and there should be, sorry, now it's stopped working for me. Um, there should be an option there to raise hand. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see Max has just raised oh, at, the, hand. at the bottom, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so Max, are you raising your hand just as a tester or do you actually have a question? You're muted, Max. You're muted. I've unmuted Max. Okay, it was just as a test. Yeah. Oh, it was just a test. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Um, Otherwise, I'm, I've, I'm going to launch into one if no one else does. Fire away, Jane. So, Francis, a lot of, I think, the problems that our students are encountering are that really what they're trying to do is, like, all work in one room with their family members and children. And I suppose I wondered if you had any comments about about that, really, <clears throat> what you think... Well, how, what can people do to cope with that sort of situation that they would never have planned? Sorry, before you answer, Francis, would it be possible for you to turn off your share screen again and then we can go back to having everybody in the same Yes, group? good idea. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Good. That's better. So. Okay, so uh, in principle, I think that's an incredibly bad idea. And, <laughs> I, right. and I think that it's a matter of trying to work out how not to do that. Because unless, unless the, the family literally only has one space, then um, there are options. I mean, one of, the, one of the images that was sent to me was a picture of a toilet which had a little uh, uh, stack of toilet paper in front of it and the computer on that and it seems to me that that people actually just need to be really creative mm -hmm. and to get rid of their image of what is a, pr a proper workspace you know mm -hmm. it, and, and we go back to the first images that we saw of that woman climbing across her her apartment it's a matter of scrutinizing every square inch the first image i didn't speak about but that was a person who works for a not-for-profit and what she found that in her kitchen was that there was a bookshelf that's exactly the right height for a standing desk and so she was able to put her her uh, her laptop on that while she cooked and so, I, in fact, I, I, I interviewed an academic who'd had a purpose-built work home, workspace, built onto her kitchen as a continuation of her kitchen because her preferred working method was to cook and work. And so she moved between the cooker and her computer. And mm. when she got stuck with her work, she went back to the cooker. And so I think, I think jettison all the ideas of what a normal workspace is and you definitely need some space between mm. family one of my life. yeah one of my friends only told me this morning that she actually went out in the car to to yes. work she took yes. the car out uh, Michaela you have a question hi yes me and Rita we both have a question <laughs> So, um, first of all, is like uh, I think uh, we had a very nice um, few years ago uh, lecture conversation about this, and uh, 
at the end we came up with the idea that maybe it's a personal choice if you feel like comfortable enough to just work at home but you know we were actually talking about this utopic view of these 24 hours during the day where eight hours are for usually for work eight hours for yourself eight hours to sleep where they're not never achievable if you have to travel one hour so the time that you actually spend for the work for working and not for yourself or more do you think that working for home is something that's going to make this achievable or if you actually have a good space you're actually going to work even more because there is nothing that is going to stop you to like an office that is going to close are you just going to carry on working without um taking time off from your actually personal life I think that's a really good question. But I think, I think it doesn't just apply to home-based workers because we all have phones and we all have computers at home. And so if we want to, we come back to the work hygiene. If we want to, we can answer our work emails at midnight. And if we're unlucky, our boss will reply to them, you know? And this is the sort of thing that I think we have to set really, really clear boundaries around. And it's to do with developing personal discipline. Um, that actually we need to decide when we're going to work and when we're not going to work. And one of the problems with um, architectural education is that what we know is that the more we work on our designs, the better they get. And so it's very problematic because students will work and work and work and work in order to improve their designs. But actually, we also do need to have lives and we also do need to sleep. And so I think that, um, I think it is completely possible to do it from home, but I think that um, it, needs, it needs discipline. One of the things that people have spoken about regularly to me is the, the, this thing of the commute, because potentially you win two hours. And so it's like, it's a bit like giving up smoking. It's very important to put that money that you save on cigarettes somewhere special, not just to fritter it away. And it's the same with those two hours that you would be traveling. It's like if you spend those two hours really looking after yourself or really having a lot of fun with your partner, then that's something, that's something that can help to create that, that discipline. Does that answer your question? It's really it's so great to have your experiences of having spoken to so many people who've practiced at doing this for a long time. Yeah. It's really been, I mean, for the idea of walking out the house and doing a, a commute, it's just genius because it is hard to switch between mooching around in the kitchen, making the coffee and chatting to the family to sit down and, and get on with work. Max, you've got a question. Hang on, can I just answer that one yes. more? Sure. Because, um, I was downstairs at the kitchen table. This is the first time I've ever done a talk like this. Mm. And I was downstairs at the kitchen table thinking to myself, I don't feel like I normally do when I'm about to give a talk. What's wrong? And then I suddenly thought, I haven't gone to work. <laughs> so, so I did this absolutely bonkers thing of going out the back door of the studio up to the end of the very small garden back again in the kitchen door round the house and i did it about eight times so i did this this journey backwards and forwards and my partner kept on saying things to me i said no no <laughs> be quiet I'm on, I'm, on my, I'm on my trip to work <laughs> and then i came upstairs and i realized that just having made that journey had raised my raised my energy or given me a bit of adrenaline or something it had made that transition very effectively rather than just gone from the kitchen table upstairs to 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 my work desk mm. sorry who was the next max. that was just a max has a question he's muted again though make sure he's unmuted hover over the bottom left of the screen max okay okay i do it myself okay Sorry, yeah. Uh, so it was, I, I was just thinking, um, I, I remember, I think in 
is there a uh, some legislation in France which um, says that like workers uh, have the right sort of not to reply to uh, messages from their employer during the evening or over the weekends or something like that? And it made me wonder if there was any specific legislation in the UK um, about what kind of um, conditions home workers should work under with their employers or whether there's any need for for um, legislation to look at that. Following up just from that Max I think it's also worth noting that in our particular unusual situation at the moment a lot of the parents I'm talking to are saying how, how can the same number of work hours be expected when actually what we're doing is also childcare so I don't it's not the same question but it's on a related note. Francis. I think that um, no there's no such legislation but I think there's good practice and I think that some of the young tech firms are setting up really really good um, practice guidelines uh, I think the best actually turn the technology off after six o'clock in the evening and they don't put it back on again until nine o'clock in the morning so people are unable to make their um, the, 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 the work emails and, and things at night. Um, and I think it's the same on holiday. Um, I know someone who is part of a young tech company and um, they have a system where when they go on holiday, there is a, a message that says, if you send me an email, I am on holiday, it will just be deleted. <laughs> I will be back now, send it when, when I get back. And I think these systems, in a way, what's so extraordinary about the current, current moment is that um, home-based work has not been taken seriously before much. There are a few companies like British Telecom, BT, that decided, ooh, maybe eight or 10 years ago, that this was something really obvious to do. And so they... Um, so they, they set up a whole policy to have home-based workers. And they've got something like 13,000. And um, I've lost my thread. Someone just came in. Ah, what was I saying? Remind me. Uh, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's the, the companies who've taken the initiative okay. more than, more than okay. the um, yeah. uh, legislators. So, they, so their policy is very much to, they, they employ people, they, they manage people through their productivity, and they really encourage people to do just as much as they need to, not to overwork. I wonder if, uh, yeah, has anyone else got a question? I've got something that fits in with that. Can, can, can it be applied to, to students then as well, so that we don't overwork? <laughs> I think it's very difficult with students because I think the problem with students is that you're not being paid for your work. Mm -hmm. your, your, your work is just something that you're doing and you're trying to do it the best you possibly can. Almost certainly, if you're working 18 hours a day, you're being much less productive than you would if you did seven. You know, just because if you're really fresh, then you're working better. But it's, it's hard. I, I, you know, having been an architectural student myself, I'm an architect. It's, it's very hard not to, not to just keep slogging on at it. In terms of the childcare, um, uh, Jane, yes, it is a, it, 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 there's no way that the government can expect when everyone is working from home like this and there are no schools and there are no nurseries, they cannot expect the same hours. And if we go back to that couple with the three-year-old twins, I worked out that each of them is doing five hours work a day. Mm. And that seems to be, to me, to be absolutely brilliant. If you can get five hours work a day done at the moment when you're um, operating without childcare, then, you know, that's amazing. It's incredible. I'm wondering in this, because we're obviously... Oh, there's two more questions, so I'll, I won't talk myself. I'll pass it on. Um, Matthew? Uh, yeah, I was going to, I think it's great to focus on like our experience and everything. Um, and uh, it's, um, 
it's good to focus on our experience and try to understand what this means for, for, for those of us who come to this seminar. But I just want to think for a moment, uh, well, actually, it does relate to, to where you started. I think there are real issues to do with wider uh, questions of economy and inequality around this situation. And you're, you're absolutely right to talk about students in their situation, some students who are sharing a house or whatever, but you can talk about the creativity that might be involved in trying to carve out space and also carve out new ways of relating. But um, I mean, a lot of my work, uh, my research is about how people live in shanty towns in formal cities. And I'm wondering how the hell people in that situation are coping, where the kind of opportunities for things, even Wi-Fi is very different. And how do you make, how do you, how do you make working where the technology is not a given um, uh, uh, even begin to work. So I, I think the positivity of some of the messages we're he hearing is great, but home working can also reinforce the inequalities that a lot of us are battling against all the time. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Absolutely. I mean, that's the position I started from, which is that home-based work for the privileged is lovely. They've got good spaces, they've got good services. And as you get less and less privileged, you know, if you think, if you think about the, the, the overcrowding in social housing today, where if you've got a, a three bedroom flat, it's probably got five people in it at least. Um, it's got a tenancy agreement that says that people aren't allowed to work in it. Um, it there, there's no way there's any spare space for children to do homework or for adults to do, to do work. No, I mean, I think, I think there's very real um, unequal pressure uh, on, on, it's the poorest who suffer, the most deprived who suffer. And in a way, what I think is one of the most interesting things about what we're going through at the moment is there are all sorts of silver linings. And one of the silver linings is what's happening to the environment. Um, planes are grounded, uh, the traffic has stopped, my street I was watching today, you know, there's about one car every half an hour. You know, I live in Hackney. Um, and usually it's cars constantly. And, and so in terms of pollution, um, it's really, really interesting. And so what I see is that what we need to do is to try to, to make sure that we don't, everything doesn't spring back to normal once this is over, like an elastic band that's been stretched and it just springs back. Because um, I think what's needed is radical redesign of our housing. That actually the way we design housing is, um, is, is as a commodity uh, in an international um, investment market rather than for its use value. So it's exchange value and not use value. And I think we have to, there has to be a sort of major campaign to start to design so that we actually can work from home well, all of us. One of the things I looked up before um, doing this was um, space standards, because one of the problems we have is that our homes are small. And I, I found a paper setting out that in the UK, our homes are the smallest in Europe uh, by floor area which I thought was extremely interesting. Um, and I think the more space you have, the easier it is. So our couple with the two twins, um, you know, they've got space. And therefore it makes what in a, in a one bedroom flat would be an intolerable situation where you might well end up with domestic violence into something that actually can be really good fun because suddenly these these children have got their parents around all the time the parents are doing less work but they're seeing a lot of each other and a lot of their family mm. Mm. um robin um yeah i suppose um my my point and question really are around um going to a workspace um that's not the home as an environment of care um i think like one thing that's an issue certainly around times where people have to be in their home sort of like Christmas and other public holidays um, is there's generally a massive spike in um, instance of domestic abuse. Um, I suppose my point is, is that 
if this becomes sort of more of a norm that we work from home, um, it could be a real issue that, you know, homes become almost like prisons and, and very, very dangerous places, especially for women. Um, so, I mean, I, I suppose the point that I'm trying to make really is that whilst it, it is a great opportunity, I think, and, and I've really benefited from working from home. Um, for some people, I guess it could be like a, like, you know, condemning them to a really, really bleak future. So I, I don't know whether you've sort of had any thoughts around that. Yes, absolutely. I, I listened to a report um, from a charity um, that works around uh, domestic abuse. And they say that um, this lock-in is incredibly dangerous for women who are in abusive relationships. And I think that... Uh, I think that's a that's a terrible terrible thing, but uh, you know, and I certainly don't support home based work under those circumstances. I mean, I've always felt that home based work should be a choice, and so for me, this is th this situation is extremely interesting, but also extremely problematic because I think that one chooses to do it when you're in a certain circumstance, and if you hate your home and you hate your partner or you're frightened of your partner, then you are now in a, a completely desperate situation. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose my point um, is as well, you know, if this becomes kind of normalized um, and people have the option, I suppose there's this risk inherent of that, that a, a domestically abusive partner might sort of insist that someone works from home. You know, this is an option for you. You should do it. Um, I, I, I don't know how that would be managed, but it's, it's kind of a terrifying <laughs> potential behind that, I suppose. Yes, I think the bigger danger is that employers insist. Yeah, I was going to say, it feels like the, the exploitation seems more likely on the part of employers in... And, and whether it is exploitative or whether in fact it's a huge boon because we free up masses of real estate if we stop having this presenteeism. Uh, so it's a, it sounds like something that needs to be managed quite carefully. Very carefully. Um, the only company that I know that insists on it is Microsoft. And I interviewed a Microsoft manager in um, Leiden in the Netherlands. and. Um, she was completely in favour, but in the Netherlands, we've got a completely different system because property is cheap. Um, rents are cheap and building your own home is cheap for, for anybody. And they don't have the same, um, the same class system that we have in the United Kingdom. They don't have the same sort of gaps between the rich and the poor. And so um, her, she, she, was, she had, was a self-builder and they built this extraordinary home where she had her workspace on the top floor in the middle of the laundry with the washing machine and the dryer and the clothes all around her because when she got bored, she did some laundry. She got three children and her partner was a furniture maker and he had his workshop on the ground floor, the lower ground floor. And it worked perfectly. But um, in the UK, it's really problematic because um, so much of our housing isn't appropriate for home-based work. And if you had to work from home, you could be in extremely um, dire circumstances, actually. Uh, we've got four questions lined up now. Max, have you still got your hand up because you've got another question or just left it up by mistake? You're on mute. I, w I wasn't inviting you to I'm just checking to see whether you had left it up by mistake. You're still on mute. Um, so because we haven't heard from them yet, I'm going to go to Colin and then Claudia uh, and then Michaela. Colin? Um, my, my question is really probably a, a bit of a long Typically, I'm, I'm conforming to stereotypes of Irish people along brand. Um, I, at the moment, am very worried about the um, mental health of some of the people who are on the screen at the moment, students particularly. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are, Francis, on 
<clears throat> the current situation around universities for the last what 15 years um universities of different hues have been selling off property and squeezing space we've seen this in the cast fairly recently of a uh, very big and much talked about situation and i'm i'm wondering what you think about the possibility of universities taking this as a as a demonstration that we can make more and more and more of this work and so therefore need less and less and less for example studio space because this has been so successful um, and what the impact of that might be on these people who pay rather a lot of money for a reasonably small amount of studio space physical studio space sure yep i think that in any in any new situation there is the opportunity for a malign response and there is an opportunity for a, 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 a positive response and i think the response that that squeezes that tries to maximize profit that stops that doesn't put at the forefront people's well-being uh, is to be resisted on all counts now i've been at london met long enough to remember when we moved from the tower from the 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 the, the holloway road campus and what we we had then <coughs> was purpose-built architecture school we had vast double height uh, studios top lit and one day without us knowing uh, the university the miserable university estates person did a survey of how many students were in each studio and they said you don't need this space because students were working from home and we lost those spaces and they moved um, humanities in and they they put in full ceilings and they divided them all into miserable little offices and so I've seen a whole a whole round of this happen already at London Met and I think you could be right I think that uh, that, that to foresee that as a possibility and then to work out very very strong systems to prevent it to resist it is going to be very important i think we can come maybe come back to this uh it's a very interesting one because colin you're saying something i guess that's quite political and somebody's phone is ringing by the way um, it's my phone was... <laughs> i'm waiting for my partner to pick it up <laughs> Something that's quite Sorry about that. and it's not just specific to London Met. But I think there's also a question of what is achievable from home. And in the case of architecture students, of course, there is something very difficult to recreate at home. And that's partially space and equipment, but it's also being in the company of other human beings who are doing the same thing. Because while we are in one another's company now, there is a definite distinction between this and being physically in the same room as other people with whom you're working and having that social engagement and that building up of a of the fire that happens around that so i'm just going to pass on to claudia now claudia your question yeah actually it's um it's really related because um well i think i think it's just following on from that silent company like zoom makes us talk so i'm really exhausted of talking actually in this context but the thing that I really miss is um, chance, chance encounters and the, and the thing about working from home is because I'm so in control of my own time, uh, I'm boring myself because there's no, I can't surprise myself, I can't bump into somebody, I can't just decide, oh, I'll go over to the print lab or I'll go this route. It's, and so I really miss bumping into colleagues randomly, like everything has to be timetabled. So I feel like the homeworking, you're really, everything is like scheduled and timetabled and I miss, I miss chance and I'm, I don't know, it's, uh, is there anything that in your, I don't know, is there anything about this kind of chance? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, I think what we have to recognize is this isn't homeworking. This is lockdown. This is a completely different thing that we're experiencing now. And we have to be really careful not to try to extrapolate from this experience 
to how it might be in the future. Um, certainly these chance encounters are terribly important and, um, and within, um, within departments like architecture, I think that they're essential. You know, I think that, I think we have to have those interactions, but that doesn't mean we have to be in an office eight hours a day in order to do it. And so it's that thing about how time and space might be more flexible. Um, one of the things I found was that people who work from home often have those chance encounters with people who live locally to them, who are working from home as well. And they, they have their sort of water cooler moments with people who aren't necessarily in the same field, but they start to exchange about their work and they exchange about the other person's work. And in some ways it, it triggers in the same way. And so um, there was one guy I interviewed who was a, a he was an IT repairman. He was, and he, he designed websites and he would walk for 20 minutes every morning to um, visit a friend of his who was a costume designer maker. And they would sit and have three quarters of an hour coffee together every day. And they would moan about their problems at work, what they were doing. They would bounce ideas away off each other and then he'd walk off home again. And I think those sorts of things can work. I don't think that the chance encounters aren't necessarily, um, and obviously we know from, the, from Silicon Valley that they're, they're desperately trying to force these chance encounters, you know, the, that actually they recognize these are the creative moments. But I think I'm, I'm just remembering, um, I did a, a when, I was, when I was doing my knowledge transfer um, project, um, I went to see one of the partners we had on that, partners in industry, was um, Baufritz, which was a very ecological housing manufacturer in Germany. And I went and visited their super duper um, um, robot factory. And what he talked about was having gone to the pub because he had to work out the insulation for his houses. And he wanted something that reused waste and he went to the pub with his neighbor on the industrial estate and his neighbor was a dairy. And what they worked out was that the dairy had all this, this waste whey and that the furniture maker had all this waste sawdust. And so they mixed the two things together and they found they made this extraordinary insulation which they then pumped into the houses. So I think it, it doesn't have to be in house, if you like. I think those interactions are necessary but they can be much more, much looser. Mm. So I think we've got uh, time really only for one more question because it's quarter to eight. So we've got to go and eight, bang our saucepans. Yeah, we've got to go and bang our saucepans at eight o'clock to say thank you to the NHS. Although in more suburban areas, you might just be banging a saucepan out the window and not be able to hear anyone else doing it. <laughs> the sort of thing that works better in high rise Italian cities than it does in uh, in 1930s estates in suburban london um, it's gonna but, be good in 19 in, in victorian terraced hatching. yeah 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 um so michaela and rita you've been waiting for ages um the last very quick question is um first of all this feeling that we were talking about uh, about the fact that somehow we were in more rush because the world around us was going so fast uh, in a way uh, is this fear of missing out that was driving us uh, and somehow in the last uh, week uh, it seems that everything around us is so stuck and still that you can breathe a bit more uh, we were wondering i know that probably is a question that no one can actually answer but do you think that somehow after this imposing utopic world we are living in right now that sometimes i think that at some point i'm gonna wake up from this nightmare <laughs> can we actually go back to our life or after this experience everything is gonna change 
or at least for some people it actually is going to change it. and this remote new virtual world is going to be our future that we were trying to achieve before but now it's been imposed do, do yeah. i make sense yeah yeah okay. i think i think i understand what you're trying to say um i'm afraid i don't think we will ever go back i think this is something that is going to change our life our world forever um in the same way as the world wars changed our life forever the the spanish flu did you know 56 million people died in the spanish flu this changed lives for many many people forever but i suppose what you're talking about is dystopian and i can see something very very positive emerging but this may be to do with the difference between your situation and my situation so i live in a terraced house in hackney and i've lived here for 30 years and for the last two years we have run street parties um for the mp that was murdered joe cox with the motto behind them we have more in common than we have between us something like that and so uh on a particular day of the year the the invitation went out to the whole of london to the whole of the country to have a street party and we did it in our street and we've got 132 households 17 of them are muslim and we had 150 people on the street a massive table two years running now full of food and what what has happened during this crisis is we've now set up a street whatsapp group and we've got someone who's just had a mastectomy and is in is very very poorly in the street we've got someone who's very very old we've got a newborn baby and we've got people who are really really looking after each other and i know that this is happening all over the place and so for me yes this is a digital world because actually i can't leave my house so so that's a problem but in the future we will be able to leave our house and i think that the community structures that are being built at the moment will be very powerful afterwards and what i would suggest is that if in your situation you're very isolated it may be that you're surrounded by other people who are very isolated too and i wonder if there are ways that you can reach out to them and if you can actually put notes under people's doors in your building or whatever it is and actually set up systems for supporting each other because i think i think that sense of of terrifying isolation in a very very dangerous world world needs to be uh scrutinized really carefully and then work out how to how to try to how to mitigate it thank you that was a nice uh, small question that you kept to last michaela <laughs> uh thank you so much francis now robin just had one small thing he wanted to share with everybody before we close if you could do it really quickly robin because i'm mindful of time um yeah just really really quickly me and michaela are actually setting up a um sort of virtual uh Sort of studio type environment thing where we're going to try and use this as an opportunity to um, sort of trade ideas with people from other universities um, and it, this is kind of just a plug really so I don't know if there's a way of um, uh, bringing everyone that's in this chat to to that um, we're looking at potentially next week Thursday um, so yeah it will be Can you post the details in the chat channel um, we, we haven't we haven't got much more than my personal email, so I'll, I'll share that. And then, okay. if any anyone would like any information about it, then um, please feel free to email Great. me. Great, thank and you so if much. You, if, if you if you want to tweet it or uh, um, go, you know do social media, just uh, use Cass Research and at the Cass Art and Jane and I and others on the channel will retweet. And share. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is the is the time to say? Say anything else, or is this the end? I'm sorry, Max. It's the end. Go on, we're really have sorry. Mm. We Go on, one. super fast. I, 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 I wanted to um, second what Claudia said about the this sort of importance for me as well with the sort of chance interactions with people moving around the building, but also the 
um, how all the interactions that I would have, say, if I was at the CAS with other people I'm working with, kind of reinforce the, the sort of structure, the fact that we're doing the same stuff. That I know that that's what I'm going to miss um, uh, just sort of being by myself. And I also thought as well that I could like design my perfect sort of my perfect home workspace with whatever that would be with like a sort of a villa and a pool and everything and I'd be there and I wouldn't get anything I wouldn't get anything done if, if I didn't have the right kind of um, uh, sort of platforms and systems working with my colleagues and, and my uh, the teachers here to sort of keep me on track so I maybe there's a question about what point um, like the sort of the space is important and then beyond that what you the sort of um, what other sort of platforms or software or um, sort of schedule systems, whatever you have established. You know what? such, such an interesting question, Max. And I almost feel, Francis, I don't know if you do, like obviously give a quick answer now, but it feels to me like we've opened up a lot of topics that we might actually a second seminar along these lines where we go more deeply into some of these things, like more specific to lockdown working might be really helpful if you were willing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. My response to Max is that this, this whole seminar has been very personally focused because we're all in lockdown and we're all in these very, very restricted personal bubbles. But this is not the utopia. The utopia, the, 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 I think that we have to think of this in a much broader sense because I don't think designing the individual dream work home is the answer. What, what, what I'm interested in is taking the absolutely bog standard blocks of flats that are being rolled out at the moment in order to make a fortune for the developers, for the builders, for the, for the, the property owners, and actually working out how you could take those and you could turn them into really, really interesting buildings full of living and working and collective spaces and places for people to meet, et cetera, et cetera. Not miserable little shoe boxes that yeah. have, have lifts for people. They arrive on a landing, they never see anyone. They go in, they out, they don't know their neighbors. So that, I think that's the challenge. I think that's the yeah. really, really exciting thing that we should be doing. Mm. Well, on Monday night, next week, we've got the second in the series of the home-based working seminars with Francis. And Francis, do you want just to give a one-minute introduction of who's on next Monday, in addition to you? We've got Sarah Wigglesworth, who has designed and built her own uh, work home for her practice, uh, which is an uh, experimental building in Newton, and it houses a practice which has about usually has about 10 employees and then we've got a guy called Jeremy Porteous who is someone who's interested in um, designing housing to accommodate all aspects of life so all housing so it's not about specialist housing really Matthew you know are you there can you say a little bit more about about because I think you know Jeremy's work even better than I do. Um, We've got four I, minutes, guys. Four minutes till the... Yeah, till maybe, maybe, maybe what, we, what we should do is just share a little more on the Cast Culture website. Yeah. Uh, but Jeremy's a great guy. He's fantastically charismatic. All come on Monday. See you then. It's called <laughs> Delight in Home-Based Work. So see you Monday and keep an eye out. Follow Cast Research on Twitter and keep going back to Cast Culture to check out for new online events. Thank you so much for Thanks, coming. Jane. Bye. Thanks, Fran. I Thank think we you. should clap. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good. 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 Good.